Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, The Epidemiology and Effects of Concurrent Dementia and Advanced Chronic Illness. This webinar series is coordinated by the Aging Initiative, which is an NIA-funded initiative that bridges the expertise and leadership of two powerhouses for research on multiple chronic conditions, the Healthcare Systems Research Network and the Claude D. Pepper Older Americans Independent Centers, or the Pepper Centers. The Aging Initiative is led by Dr. Jerry Gerwitz at UMass Chan Medical School, along with co-PIs Elise Adams and Jay Magaziner. My name is Leah Hansen. I'm a senior investigator at Health Partners Institute in Minnesota. Along with Heather Whitson at Duke University, I co-lead the Aging Initiative Career Development Corps. Due to the number of registrants for today's webinar, we have placed phone lines on mute to reduce audio feedback. However, we welcome and encourage audience participation using the Q&A function. If you do have technical or logistical questions, we ask that you submit those into the chat to Ali DeRochers, Research Coordinator at UMass Chan Medical School, who supports the Aging Initiative. And now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Today, our presenter is Dr. Stephanie Nothel. She is an internal medicine and geriatric medicine physician and clinician scientist at John Hopkins University School of Medicine with a joint appointment in the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Nothel completed her medical degree at Indiana University School of Medicine and her residency and fellowship at Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center and John Hopkins University. Her research focuses on improving healthcare delivery for older adults who live with dementia and complex health and social needs. During today's webinar, Dr. Nothel will discuss the epidemiology of concurrent dementia and advanced chronic illness and its impacts on health systems, patients, and families. Today, we will also be joined by two discussants on this webinar. The first is Dr. Kenneth Lamb, an assistant professor in the Division of Geriatric Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, a GEMSTAR awardee, and alumnus of the MCC Scholars Program. As a geriatrician who regularly counsels and tries to help older persons as they encounter health crises and increasing functional dependence, he studies the experience of physical and cognitive disability in late life and the relationship to entry into long-term care facilities. His research employs mixed methods, including longitudinal analysis of repeated measures and national studies on aging, semi-structured interviews, and focus groups of recent nursing home and assisted living entrants on healthcare professionals working in those settings. He's board certified in internal medicine and geriatric medicine in the US and Canada, and has clinical and QI experience working on inpatient wards, post-acute care, and geriatric ED accreditation. We are also pleased to be joined by Adeline Mitten. She is the Director of the Office of Continuing Medical Education at Downstate Health Sciences University, where she oversees the management of comprehensive continuing education offerings for physicians, nurses, social workers, dietitians, and the entire range of the healthcare team. In this role, she's focused on aligning, aligning the interdisciplinary team to benefit the patients for better healthcare outcomes. Ms. Mitten also serves as an Aging Initiative Patient Caregiver Advisory Council, or APCAC, council member. She was a caregiver to her mother who suffered from Alzheimer's and her brother from cardiovascular disease. Now I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Nothel. Great, thanks so much for that introduction, Dr. Hansen, and thanks everyone for taking some time out of your um, Friday to join us. Um, as was already said, uh, the title of my talk is The Epidemiology and Effects of Concurrent Dementia and Advanced, Ill Advanced Chronic Illness. I have no disclosures to share today. Um, before we dive into the research, I wanted to ground today's talk in a patient example. Um, as was said earlier, I'm, I'm a geriatrician, a clinician who practices mostly in geriatric primary care. Um, and a lot of my research questions and inspiration for my research comes from the patients and families that I have an opportunity to work with in the clinical setting. So although Mr. Smith is hypothetical, he is based off of um, several patients I've had the opportunity to um, care for. So uh, this patient is an 83-year-old man. He lives with dementia and diabetes um, for which he takes insulin. His diabetes is complicated by peripheral vascular disease. Um, for the non-clinicians in the Zoom room, um, that just means that his 
diabetes was probably poorly controlled at some point in his life and led to some obstruction in the blood vessels in his leg. Because of that, he had to have two pretty serious operations. Um, first, a right lower extremity bypass, and then a left partial foot amputation. Um, he also has chronic kidney disease and hypertension. He takes 10 medications, including insulin. Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith was living independently until relatively recently. Um, he now lives with his adult daughter. His daughter was increasingly worried about his ability to take care of himself on his own, manage his complex medication regimen. Um, so she moved him in with her. She helps with most of his instrumental activities of daily living, including managing his medications and scheduling his doctor's appointments. Um, she does all that she can um, to take care of him, but she also works full time. Um, so she's not always able to come to appointments with him, um, but relies on the patient portal and um, sends messages to his um, care team as needed. So in this hypothetical situation, you're the primary care doc. Um, and one day she does come in with him to a visit. Um, and she is just feeling very overwhelmed. She says, you know, is this, is this going to keep happening? Um, and you, as um, his primary care doctor, are also feeling kind of overwhelmed by just the volume of data um, and all the different transitions of care that you're hearing he's going through. So looking back over the last year, he spent five days in the hospital across uh, two different hospitalizations. He's been to the emergency department twice. Um, he had a skilled um, post-acute nursing facility stay after one of his hospitalizations. He's had five outpatient visits. And on average, every day, his adult daughter um, and other family members provide about five hours of hands-on um, direct caregiving. And so she asks you, is this typical? Is this going to keep happening? Was this a bad year? Did I do something wrong? Is this bad luck? Um, and you wonder, this is typical, right? <laughs> um, you know, certainly I've seen other patients have this pattern of healthcare use, um, but how many people are there like Mr. Smith who are trying to manage this complex chronic illness um, and what is their experience like? So uh, with this situation in mind, we're going to cover these two topics um, over the next 20 minutes or so. Um, I should say, I said to the other panelists, but um, anyone can feel free to let me know. Sometimes my internet gets a little spotty. And so if I cut out, please let me know and I'll, I'll turn my camera off. Um, but these are the, the two topics that we'll be covering. First, you know, who comprises the population living with dementia and advanced chronic illness? Um, and then second, what are the implications for living with both of these serious conditions? So first up, um, who is this population? So um, you all probably know that um, most persons living with dementia have additional chronic medical conditions. Um, today I'm talking about advanced, me advanced chronic medical conditions and we'll get to the definition of that in a moment, um, but there is already robust data that um, something like over 90% of people with dementia live with a chronic medical condition. And paying attention to these non-dementia chronic conditions is very important um, because multiple studies, just a, a small um, group of them is represented in the bottom um, right-hand corner of the slide, um, have shown that it's the non-dementia chronic medical conditions that can contribute to greater functional and cognitive decline in persons with dementia, increased neuropsychiatric symptoms, increased healthcare use, and increased caregiver burden. Um, however, most of these studies have looked at individual chronic conditions, so just dementia and diabetes, or just dementia and heart failure, for example, or they've looked at the sum of chronic conditions. So what is it like to have dementia and two or three chronic conditions? Um, however, we know that chronic conditions occur on a spectrum, and so sometimes adding together the number of chronic conditions can be kind of like adding together apples and oranges, right? Um, on one end of the spectrum, there's things like high blood pressure managed with one medication or osteoarthritis for which the person manages with um, Tylenol. And on the other end of the spectrum, there's things like end-stage renal disease where the person's going to dialysis three times a week or heart failure where the person's in and out um, of the hospital um, and lots of stuff in between. And um, what I realized um, in, in thinking about this topic is that we don't really know very much at all um, about what happens to people with dementia who are at this far end of the spectrum who have truly advanced chronic illness. 
Um, and this seemed rather important to me because we know that living with advanced chronic illness is very burdensome for families and patients to take care of, very costly for health systems um, and society. And we know the same is true about dementia. Um, so what happens when these two things occur together um, and do they occur together? So uh, to answer this question, um, I turned to methods that were um, initially created by uh, Dr. Amy Kelly. Um, so Dr. Kelly is a geriatrician and palliative um, medicine um, physician who came up with this conceptual definition of serious illness um, by talking to a number of experts in geriatrics and palliative medicine. So as listed on the left-hand side of the slide, um, serious illness is a condition with a high risk of mortality that negatively impacts function or quality of life or excessively strains caregivers. Um, and Dr. Kelly and her colleagues determined that there are really three manifestations of serious illness in older adults um, represented by the three circles on the slide. So activity of daily living impairment, dementia, and advanced medical conditions. Activity of daily living impairment and dementia are probably pretty self-explanatory um, to this audience, but what about this advanced medical condition um, bucket? You know, how do you operationalize using administrative data or Medicare claims that a medical condition like diabetes has reached the point where it um, meets this conceptual definition? Um, so Dr. Kelly and her colleagues um, accomplished this by being very, very specific. Um, and the ICD codes and other claims um, that they used to identify conditions. So um, on this slide are just some examples. It's not a complete list, um, but these are the most common um, advanced conditions that um, showed up in my research. And so while chronic kidney disease is uh, a chronic condition, um, in order to qualify as a serious illness or an advanced medical condition, um, the, the claim in Medicare had to be for end-stage renal failure on dialysis, so stage five CKD. Um, similarly, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a very common chronic condition. However, to be considered an advanced medical condition, um, the person needed to be um, on supplemental oxygen or have an admission for a COPD exacerbation, um, and so on and so forth, as listed on this slide. Um, with Dr. Kelly's foundational work, she showed that, you know, using um, these ICD codes to identify um, advanced medical conditions and, um, you know, identifying older adults with dementia and activity of daily living impairment, this really captured a very high cost and high need population. Um, however, in her initial work, she didn't look at the intersection of these different conditions. Um, and specifically the intersection between dementia and advanced medical conditions. Um, and so I had the opportunity to work with her and, and others to really dig into this question. Um, so to look at this, um, I'm gonna share a little bit about a study that I did um, under her mentorship with others. Um, we used data from the health and retirement study um, linked to Medicare fee-for-service claims. Um, for those of you not familiar with the Health and Retirement Study, it is a nationally representative survey of older adults in the United States. Um, older adults are surveyed every other year about a range of topics, including functional and cognitive impairment. Um, and we linked the, the data from the 2016 wave of um, the Health and Retirement Study to 12 months of fee-for-service Medicare claims um, pre and post that survey. Um, we limited our population to adults 65 years of age and older. And we used the 12 months pre-interview um, claims to ascertain serious illness. So to identify people that met, um, that had ADL impairment based on survey responses about needing help with activities of daily living. Um, older adults with dementia were identified by a validated algorithm by HERD et al. that uses um, cognitive test scores and self-report of dementia diagnosis, among um, other things, to indicate probable dementia. Um, and then lastly, advanced medical conditions were identified, as I previously described, using a combination of ICD codes and other claims. Um, and then we looked in the 12 months after um, the survey to look at various outcomes. Um, so specifically caregiving intensity, including number of caregivers and number of caregiving hours, um, and then acute care use and Medicare costs. 
Okay, so I apologize that the Venn diagram has shifted slightly from <laughs> the previous slide, but um, uh, the colors remain the same. So um, hopefully this looks familiar. So here you can see, this is a proportional Venn diagram. I used um, a fancy online software to, to make these circles proportional to the population sizes. Um, and so you can see the three different manifestations of serious illness, activity of daily living impairment, dementia, and advanced medical conditions. Um, these numbers and the millions um, were generated because we used the health and retirement survey um, weights that allow you to project population estimates of the size of the population in the U.S. represented um, by the HRS survey respondents. And so um, I'm going to draw our attention over here um, to the blue and the green circles. Those are our circles of interest for today. And so you can see for the entire blue circle, the approximately 2 million older adults with dementia, um, that they are broken um, into further subgroups. So about 30% of the overall population um, in HRS living with dementia have um, what I'm gonna refer to as dementia alone. Um, when I say dementia alone, I mean that they don't have ADL impairment or advanced medical conditions. They might have other chronic conditions, right? They might have hypertension um, or osteoarthritis, but um, did not meet any of the other um, manifestations of serious illness. Um, 45%, um, a very large subset of people living with dementia, have ADL impairment um, alone without an advanced medical condition. Um, and then lastly, this population we were really curious about, um, about a quarter, 24%, um, have uh, dementia and an advanced medical condition, um, most of whom also have ADL impairment. Um, so although I have um, a table that looks at all of the different subgroups, um, it is really overwhelming to look at. And so I simplified for this slide um, just two groups of interest, um, but I'm more than happy to share the um, large overwhelming um, table with anyone who's interested. Um, so you can see here in the left-hand column, um, the overall circle of people with dementia. So it was a population estimate of 2 million people, um, but the raw number was about 489 people. Um, and then on the, the right-hand column, you can see um, our subgroup of interest, persons living with dementia who also have an advanced medical condition um, with or without ADL impairment. And so quickly just comparing the two groups, you can see that the subset of persons with dementia and an advanced medical condition tend to be slightly younger. Um, I love that slightly younger as a geriatrician is, is 85 years old in this study. We usually don't have data on um, so much data on people in these age groups. Um, you can see that the proportion of uh, people with a female sex is slightly lower. Um, the racial and um, ethnic diversity is um, less in the dementia and advanced medical condition group. Um, so some of these um, cells were too small to report. Medicare um, has some specific criteria over cell size um, about what's disclosable. And so the NR means not reportable. Um, but you can see that the non-Hispanic white um, subset is smaller in the advanced medical condition group than in the overall dementia group. Um, similarly, um, persons with an advanced medical condition were overall what I would characterize as sicker, right? So much more likely to have fair or poor um, self-rated health, um, more chronic conditions on average, and slightly higher proportion of functional impairment. Um, so key points for our first agenda item um, were that about one in four persons living with dementia have an advanced medical condition. Um, and that people in this subpopulation um, tend to be younger and sicker than the overall um, population of persons living with dementia. All right, transitioning now to our second um, agenda item. What does this all mean um, for, for people who um, are living with dementia and advanced chronic illness? So continuing on with the same data from the same study, I was just talking about HRS linked to claims. Um, this table shows just some of the um, health services use outcomes that we looked at. Um, I did add one additional column here. Um, I've given this talk before and got some feedback that it'd be helpful to know what a typical older adult, um, a not seriously ill older adult, how they use the healthcare system um, per year. So that, that's what this first column is. Um, the second column is still that overall circle of everyone 
um, who is living with dementia. And then our last column here is the subgroup of interest. And what you can see is perhaps um, unsurprisingly that the proportion with an emergency department visit, the proportion with the hospital admission, the number of days in the hospital are all greater in this subgroup um, with advanced chronic illness. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, correspondingly, um, Medicare costs, whether you look at a mean or a median, um, are significantly higher. Um, of course, Medicare costs are only part of the costs. Um, so far, I've focused mostly on the implications for um, the health system and for, for Medicare, but what about patients and families? They're the ones really living with this. Um, and so HRS is really unique in that it does report out-of-pocket costs. Um, so that's what you're looking at here. Um, I did mix it up a little bit. I hope it's not too confusing. I have more subgroups here. I find that figures are much more digestible than tables. So I left in the subgroups from um, the figure from our paper. Um, but I'll just quickly orient you. Um, the three groups above this blue line um, are mutually exclusive groups. Um, so this top one is our group of interest that we've been focusing on. The second group, dementia and ADL impairment, are those with dementia and ADL impairment, but who don't have an advanced medical condition. Um, and then this last group is the dementia quote, only um, without ADL impairment or an advanced medical condition. And then below the blue line is, you know, the combination of everything above the blue line. And so what you can see here is that in green, we have median annual Medicare costs. And then in yellow, we have median out-of-pocket expenditures that um, older adults and their proxies reported in the HRS survey. And so um, just like as on the previous slide, Medicare costs are the highest in the subgroup with advanced medical conditions. Out-of-pocket costs are not the highest in the subgroup. It's actually those um, with dementia and ADL impairment that have slightly higher um, median out-of-pocket costs, but still um, pretty significantly um, high. And then lastly, um, uh, we also examine hours of um, caregiving um, for each of the subgroups that I just oriented you to on the previous slide. Um, so here we have mean number of caregiving hours in a month. Um, the uh, total bar shows the total caregiving. I'm getting a message that my internet is unstable. Um, so I'm going to turn my video off. Um, Ken or um, Adeline, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay, great. I'm going to keep going then. Um, so um, the red part of the bar um, or orange, I don't know what color you call this, um, is the mean number of hours of paid help. And then the much larger part of the bar are the mean hours of unpaid help. Um, and again, here you can see that our subgroup of interest, um, persons with dementia and an advanced medical condition, are kind of leading the pack once again, unfortunately, um, with the um, most number of hours of um, caregiving help, the largest proportion of which is unfortunately unpaid. Um, so, so far we've established that this subpopulation of interest is kind of a, a high cost and high need subpopulation, um, but they're also at high risk of mortality. That um, About 25% of people in this subgroup um, die per year, according to some of um, my work. And so one other question that um, this study didn't answer was what happens near the end of life? Does healthcare use remain high? Or um, I tend to be someone whose glass is always half full. I optimistically thought maybe because they're so sick, they'd be more likely to enroll in hospice and have lower acute um, case near the end of life. Um, so uh, tried to answer this question with another data set. Um, here I used the, something called the Rochester Epidemiology Project. Um, so this is data from, um, for those of you who are not from the, the Midwest, you may not know what these states are. Um, I'm from the Midwest, the flyover country, so to say. Um, this yellow state is Wisconsin, the blue state is Minnesota. Um, the rep captures um, almost the entire population living in these counties highlighted here. Um, it's something around 90% of the population there has given consent um, to the Mayo Clinic to be part of the study. And so they have access to their electronic medical records. And so we use data from the rep from 2017 to 2018, um, limited to older adults 65 and older who died um, and who met that previous definition of serious illness that I shared um, created by Dr. Kelly. 
And then we use Poisson regression to look at incident rate ratios of acute care use and uh, near the end of life. Um, very, very briefly, I just wanted to highlight that um, although the age and sex breakdown in this population is similar to the HRS survey, and because of the part of the country um, represented here, it's a predominantly non-Hispanic white population. So I'm just gonna share this one um, uh, figure uh, from the paper um, to make the point that um, acute care use stays high <laughs> um, right up until uh, the end of life for this subgroup. So to quickly orient you to what you're looking at, this is um, ED visits, hospitalization, and ICU stays in the last six months of life. Um, the reference group are persons with dementia um, alone without um, other types of serious illness. And then the red horizontal bar that I have um, highlighted in this box are those that have dementia in an advanced chronic condition. And so you can see that um, all three types of health service use are higher for this subgroup than for persons um, with dementia um, up until the up through the last six months of life. Okay. So bringing it together, um, the key points for our second agenda item um, were that Medicare cost and acute care utilization um, is highest among the subgroup of persons living with dementia who also have an advanced chronic illness, um, and that caregiving hours are also significantly higher among um, this subpopulation. Um, so thinking back to Mr. Smith, uh, the hypothetical patient I introduced you to earlier, um, was his experience typical? Yes, actually, when I created this slide, I took averages from the studies I presented and other data that I didn't have time to share today um, to come up with these numbers. So this is the typical experience per year for someone um, who falls into this population of, of dementia and advanced uh, medical condition. Um, and unfortunately, it uh, although I haven't done longitudinal studies to look year over year over year, um, there is evidence that... Um, this was likely to, to stay the case um, up and through the end of his life, unless he um, chooses another pathway for his care. Um, so what, what do we do about this? Why is this happening? Um, this isn't from my own work, but thinking about, um, again, my glass is half full. Um, how can we take this um, information that's maybe a little disheartening um, and make it a little bit more heartening? Um, is that a word, heartening? Um, I like to see this as um, an opportunity, right? Um, an opportunity to, to try to improve care. Um, and so um, what this slide represents is um, some um, results from qualitative studies that have um, spoken with patients and families who are living with dementia and chronic conditions about what the barriers are to care, maybe why we're seeing some of these high costs um, and repeated acute um, care visits. And um, one quote that I really liked that I put at the top of the slide is that current chronic condition care is simply not dementia aware. Um, and the studies pointed out that there's an element of literal awareness that um, non-dementia specialty providers sometimes said, oh, that patient has dementia or cognitive impairment. I didn't know that. Um, and so they weren't able to tailor their approach um, you know, accordingly. And then there's lots of um, examples of figurative awareness, right? That we don't um, deliver most healthcare um, in a way that um, is ideal for persons living with dementia. We don't routinely incorporate care partners. Um, we're not really monitoring and responding to changes in cognition um, and personalizing treatment plans, you know, based on goals and preferences for care um, is sometimes hard to do in our healthcare system. Um, so again, I think this represents an opportunity, um, an opportunity for, for more research on the impacts of co-occurring chronic conditions um, and dementia, and then also hopefully lots of um, interventions for health systems and community-based um, improvements to better support people living in this um, subpopulation. Um, so with that, um, I will wrap up. Um, many thanks to the people listed on this slide and many others. Um, and the NIA for funding my work. Um, I welcome your thoughts at the Q&A time, um, although certainly feel free to put them into the chat. And then my um, email address is here um, if you want to send me a message privately. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for an excellent presentation. If you have questions, you can start entering them into the Q&A box. 
And uh, while, while you're doing that, we will now hear from our discussants, Dr. Kenneth Lamb and Adeline Mitten. Yeah, um, thank you, Stephanie, uh, for, for that uh, really great presentation outlining some of your work that's been looking into this uh, very salient problem, I think, for uh, older adults in the U.S. that uh, certainly as the primary care physician, I think you, you really cast the problem well uh, by grounding it in a case that, you know, we can read research about peripheral vascular disease, we can read research about dementia, but the reality, uh, or read research about diabetes, but the reality is that the patient that you're seeing in front of you is often dealing with many of these things all at the same time. And uh, I, I really love your study because I think it, uh, it just kind of puts a flag in the sand on how often this is a problem and the extent to which uh, our research is kind of a little bit divorced from reality. Um, I, I was curious to know, uh, it's, uh, Adeline, uh, you'd, I think before we had talked a little bit about what we might discuss, uh, but I know uh, that you have some personal experience with what it feels like to try and manage uh, an advanced medical condition alongside dementia. And I was just wondering whether or not you could also uh, ground our talk in reality. Oh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Natal Stephanie, for doing this, because uh, it definitely resonates with me when I hear you mention about all these other chronic diseases, because with my own mother, I remember uh, first not knowing that she had dementia until I discovered that it was dementia, because I did not understand the signs in the beginning, because she suffered from severe depression, uh, borderline schizophrenia in the past, and been hospitalized several times because of it. So I wasn't sure if her symptoms were due to her mental you know, illness or was it something else? And then when I found out that you know, she was diagnosed with uh, dementia, then it, it was a little confusing. So because I had to deal with the two of the two of the two things at once, and they both were dealing with the mind, so it was uh, really difficult. So definitely uh, had a real hard impact on me and myself and my family. Uh, on dealing with it. Could you talk, uh, or Stephanie? Could you share a little bit, at least clinically, how you see some of these two things interact with one another to cause? the utilization increases? I mean, you've found it in the data and also, you know, you practice. So can you talk a little bit about any sort of experiences that you might have had seeing how, how you end up with the results that you found? Sure. I can give you an example from last week in clinic. Um, <laughs> we are having wave number I don't know, a thousand of COVID um, where I live here in Baltimore. And so one of my my patients who um, has always had mild cognitive impairment, but was living independently and doing great. Um, she has multiple chronic conditions, including uh, diabetes and insulin. Um, she developed COVID. And in that setting, um, her cognition kind of took a hit, so to say. She became more confused and um, couldn't remember how to manage her medications. Thankfully, her daughter um, noticed um, and took her in. And then the daughter shows up at a visit. I've never met the daughter. Um, and she says, um, I don't know anything about diabetes. Can you teach me how to manage her diabetes? Um, mm. Oh, and also she didn't bring any of her medications to my house. Can mm. you give me an accurate medication list of all the medications, what they're for and who should fill them? And I'm like looking at the clock. I'm like, oh, I'm already running behind. Mm -hmm. This is information that she 150% deserves and needs to know. Um, and it's not information that's, you know, readily accessible for me to, you think I could push a button in my EMR and get a, an accurate list of medications and the indications and who's prescribing them and also explain to her how to manage diabetes um, while doing an evaluation for the fact that she has COVID and her cognition has declined. Um, I think these things happen very precipitously. Um, and then um, the health system just isn't designed well to then give the patient and family what they need. Yeah. So I ended up running even more behind in clinic, which, you know, um, as a whole other can of worms, mm -hmm. but, um, mm -hmm. to try to give them what they needed and, and connect them with the resources that they need. Um, you know, in hindsight, maybe I should have, um, 
incorporated the care partner earlier on when I recognized that she she had mild cognitive impairment um, in case the situation came up. But I think that, um, you know, e even as a geriatrician, that's not always um, logistically possible or, you know, the patient maybe wants um, to assert his or her independence and doesn't want the family member involved um, until needed. Yeah. One of the things I think about a lot as a geriatrician is how um, when you have an advanced medical condition, the nature of your ADLs themselves change that, you know, we have this canonical list of things that everyone needs to do in order to stay alive, something like uh, you have to shower every day, you have to get dressed every day, you have to be able to get around, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but once you have an advanced medical condition, all of a sudden, uh, things that we would consider usually instrumental ADLs or things that are like nice to have, but not necessary to have, like taking your medications, getting to the pharmacy, getting to appointments, all of a sudden, if you have an advanced medical condition, those become very critical to just stay alive. And I think that's the thing that uh, cognitive impairment and dementia really make very difficult. And it just opens up a, a world of potential mistakes that I think we don't do a good job of measuring uh, the extent to which those mistakes are happening uh, in large part because as you, you commented, our, as a system where we don't know even how often it exists, which is why I think your paper is really important. And we don't know how, how often it happens and, and why does it happen and where are there places that might be doing it better. Uh, uh, so so yeah, I, I, I just resonate with what you're sharing because yeah, I've seen it a lot too. Well, in my case, I think I remember having to um, put all take a put it on my cell phone because each time I had to go <laughs> take my yeah. mother one to her appointment, it would be the first thing that they would ask me. You know, what what medication is she on? What does she need? And I have to pull out my cell phone and give out the list of things that names that I didn't know. I didn't know what they were for. So as I start to manage her medication, they start to explain to me what this medication was for, what she needed. You know, then because and then the transportation is a real was a real big issue. Right. It was dependent on accessory, this the little bus that will come and pick her up, and you gotta set the appointment ahead of time, a week of a time. Sometimes they come, sometimes they out. And I work full time and as a caregiver, it slowly start to get to the point where I needed to go with her to the appointment because she right. would not remember how to take the bus, how to get off the bus. She did not remember the number, so it be the so the the burden started to increase very very early on, and I added more and more because all these things that were we were, we're not thinking about, and people did mm -hmm. not explain to me that this is gonna come down the line where she's gonna need help doing the medication, she's gonna need to help with her feeding, and she's gonna need help uh, giving her medication in the morning. This is what you take. And this is what you need. She also had uh, diabetes. She had high blood pressures. She had uh, chronic arthritis. So all the different type of medication had to be managed. I'm so curious to know. Uh, how, in, in you also had mentioned that that diagnosis of dementia was an important step. Can you tell me what your caregiving looked like? How did the caregiving change when when? you discovered or someone made the diagnosis of dementia or how did the, the way the system treated you, uh, did that change at all when the diagnosis was made? Like, was that important at all? It was important because it put it gives us a name, it gives us a clue because we were so confused to what was happening to her. So because at first we thought it was perhaps she the, she's not taking her medication. She used to go to a community center every day uh, to, with, you know, with meet with They'll go play bingo, they will take her on trips. And then we started noticing that she would refuse to go on, on uh, to the community center. She would talk on the phone to her friends and that started to decline. She would not call and, and the phone was like her, you know, she would not watch TV. Like all the social aspects of, started, of her life started to kind of go away. Mm -hmm. And then I think the, the, the light bulb went up when she couldn't get, she couldn't eat. We give, we'll give her the food. She wasn't sure she could pick up the spoon or the fork. So, and then that brings us. So when we got her diagnosed, we, okay, now we know it's dementia. Now what, what do we do? What does that mean? 
So I mm -hmm. had to go and start doing a little research about the disease to find out what it what it was, what it is, and what we, we do. Uh, the primary care provider gave us some guidance, and then and then the biggest dilemma for me was trying to get an aid. You know what are uh, managing all these Medicare. Um, mm -hmm. all these Medicare path that you have to manage in order to get her an aid to come to the house to stay with her. That mm -hmm. took the longest time. And I feel that this there's a gap that need right there that the government is not noticing or the elder care, is, they're not providing that, is how do you manage this? Where do mm -hmm. you get the mm -hmm. help? Do, who do I call? Mm -hmm. So I had to, to suffer to several offices in order to get to that point, or oh, this is how you would get an aid and this is how Medicare should pay for it in order for you to get the assistance. Yeah. And I think that was the biggest thing that we had to deal with. Yeah, it's a it's such a thick and it's such a, a, a <laughs> viscous for like so much, there's so much friction as you go through the whole process. You know? Yes, yes, because you know, it is it, managed care is very difficult to manage. You know, if, you, if you're on Medicare, you need to get the aid, you need to get the wheelchair, you need to find out what can you charge, what is an out of pocket cost, what is not an out of pocket cost. And, and how do we get her to appointment in their physician, especially during COVID? It, it even increases because no one will come to the house. So now we're at the point where I cannot put her on the wheelchair because there's COVID and she was confused that everyone that was coming to her room had a mask and she's looking at us all confused why are you guys wearing a mask? <laughs> so during COVID, it was even more difficult. And she was also hospitalized during COVID because she had a, a stroke. So I have I could not be at the hospital to assist her. And mm -hmm. so we had to be on the phone, on the cell phone, telling her, I didn't abandon you. I'm still here. Uh, we care about you, but you need to eat yeah. and you're gonna come home because yeah. she she was so confused. You know, so all this uh there's a lot of little loopholes, there's a lot of gap that we're not filled when it comes to elder care and dementia. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, we do have a question in the Q and A, uh, which I thought I'd bring up because it it highlights maybe the I don't know if it's the other end of the spectrum, but it, it highlights how you know these stories and policy can sometimes be a little disconnected. So I'll do my best to paraphrase what Joanne Lynn is saying for those uh, who can't see it. Uh, but uh, basically, under proposed regulations on medical treatment for persons li living with disabilities, uh, dementia is considered a disability. Uh, and not a chronic condition. And so you cannot use it or you, you cannot use its prognosis for survival to determine treatment options. And so the example she gives is that if someone with dementia and a serious chronic person uh, with no pre-specified goals of care were to develop COVID respiratory failure, they would have uh, uh, equal chance at a ventilator as anybody else. And even though we know that these conditions portend a poor prognosis, it can't be used. And so it creates these, how things are, maybe the broad, the broad version of that is that how things get categorized actually have a lot of cascading effects to the care that you, you are sort of experiencing on the front lines. And I think uh, uh, Joanne Lynn is trying to bring up how uh, the categorization of dementia, uh, it is related to whether or not someone lives or dies, but it is not used in those calculations. And the question is, how should we, what do we think? How should we deal with that? <laughs> uh, that's a huge uh, question. Uh, Steph, I don't know, you you just popped on video. Maybe you want to try to take a, take a stab at it. I popped on video just to make sure that you guys knew that I was still here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got the message that my internet was spotty again. Again, so I turned my video off um, to try to save bandwidth. Yeah, I that is such a um, I don't have a straightforward answer. I guess is the the short answer. Um, it's it's a huge um, a huge messy topic. I guess I'd be curious to know how they came to categorizing dementia as a disability and like what the I don't know. I, I I'd be curious to know what the conversation was there, what the different decision points there were, because I certainly think about it as as a chronic condition, um, uh, and and a, a disability. Um, but I think a, a challenge in the United States is, um, you know, patient autonomy is um, 
is kind of the driving force. Um, and I think another challenge that makes that policy really messy is that we aren't good at eliciting goals of care. Um, and so I think a lot of people might go into that situation without pre-specified goals of care. Um, and so that, that adds another complicating factor. I don't know if you have any thoughts, um, Adeline. Uh, I th no, we do not go into it with a goal for care. I think once someone, I guess, close to us become ill, we need to devise a care plan, right? Who is beginning, I guess, with the home and kind of filling out to the side, you know, you kind of start to develop a circle of care. I mean, my my mother, I mean, we are like six kids, I think, but because she lives with me, mm -hmm. so the care felt with me. And it started to go, you know, was it the AIDS next? Was it my brother's next? Was it my sister next? And, you know, who do I call for care? So, and also um, if I needed a break, if I had to be at work and then I could not be away and, you know, if the aid, say if there's a snowstorm and the aid cannot come to the home, what do I do? So yeah, there's the, a care plan is definitely uh, important to have, you know? Yeah. But I don't know why they would not put it in the category of being a chronic. What did you say that caused the category was... Um, I, I don't know if I paraphrased advanced. it wrong. I was doing my best to interpret uh, 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 <laughs> what is a, it's a very thick question. <laughs> okay. But uh, I, I, I'll also add that I do think it does cut to the heart of uh, one of the real challenges in geriatrics. And I think you brought it up in some ways really well, Steph, that um, I think that these are questions that have to be answered at a societal level, because uh, from an ethical standpoint, uh, we have you know large policies like the American Disabilities Act, which states that we should not be discriminating against persons with disabilities. And so someone who has a disability versus someone who doesn't should be given equal opportunity and choice. And I think that that's, you know, a huge part of the American uh, ethic uh, around, you know, who, how we see ourselves as a people. But aging produces all these paradoxes that break mm -hmm. a lot of these principles down. Because, you know, what do you then do when you have a disability and an advanced medical condition? Like, it is it is more, I think, Steph, your, some of your work is can, could actually be painted as very controversial because you're showing just how much more work it takes in order to make that playing field level. And I do think that those are questions that I don't know if whether or not those are things that we, we can answer per se as researchers, because I don't think research can tell us what ought to happen, but we can at least paint in very clear terms what is happening uh, to hopefully prompt, I think, those societal questions in terms of what do we want or what should we do? But I do think that, uh, yeah, you're, you're obviously, we're, we're all walking into a very uh, rich and complex area that is uh, borders on ethics. Yeah, it, it affects daily living. It's a daily living impairment. It affects daily living. So it should be. It's a man, you know, part of the manifestation of chronic disease, dementia. It happens all the time. Um, sorry, I, I saw another uh, response by Joanne Lynn, and I thought I'd just make sure that it was said. Uh, dementia is merely a disability, is to be irrelevant to deciding about other treatments. Otherwise, it's discrimination. Uh, mm. And so it's not a question of it not being a chronic condition. Sorry, I misinterpreted, uh, but that's not part of the regulation proposed. It's that uh, it's merely a disability and it is to be irrelevant when deciding about other treatments. I see. Um, so, but I do think hopefully we brought out, yeah, that uh, that is perhaps why some of your work, Stephanie, is very controversial because you're showing how much uh, cost is related to the interaction of those two things, even as we have rules that basically state uh, we should be trying to make sure that we are not discriminating against persons with disabilities. Um, I was curious also, uh, Stephanie, uh, you've gone through this process of submitting this paper to journals, uh, and I thought, uh, since this is an audience also of researchers and, and you know, uh, people in policy and thinkers, uh, can you share a little bit about sort of what were the back and forth between some of your reviewers? What did other people say when they were trying to appraise this research in terms of what was strong about it or what were potential weaknesses and what did you change as you were going towards publication? Yeah, um, it's a good question. People have a really hard time. Um, it is controversial, I guess I could say. Not that my way is the absolute best way. Um, I don't mean to say that. Um, 
but there were lots of strong opinions about creating these different categories. Um, so for example, separating out um, dementia and ADL impairment, um, a lot of the reviewers argued, and it makes sense to me, their argument makes perfect sense to me, um, that if you have dementia and an ADL impairment, isn't that the same thing? Like, isn't that just advanced dementia, that your dementia has gotten to a point where you now have ADL impairment? Um, and so, um, you know, for one of the studies, the, the one that looked at the end of life using the Rochester Epidemiology Project data, we actually redid the analysis a second way, excluding um, ADL impairment as a, quote, serious illness, um, and found pretty much the same results. Um, and uh, I somehow wordsmithed my way out of it with the uh, the other paper using HRS, but I think, um, you know, coming up with some of these categories is a little bit artificial, right? Like we have to draw a line in the sand to say you fit in this bucket or that bucket, but um, uh, semantics gets in the way. Mm. I don't know if that all came through. It it did come through, yeah. The, yes. Uh, you were, yeah. I'll also add, I suppose, for others in the room, since this is a talk on MCCs and, and dementia, I think that or at least part of the audience that yes, there's a, a lot of complication around uh, the definition of dementia. Uh, you know, according to your DSM criteria, functional impairment is a criterion for having dementia. So you have to have an impairment in at least one IADL. Uh, and uh, that is dementia as a syndrome, but that differs from dementia as disease. Uh, with the NIA, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is uh, releasing this year revised guidance and a consensus statement about research definitions for, you know, what is dementia? Uh, do we separate out Alzheimer's disease from Alzheimer's dementia, which is the syndrome, the phenomenon of the cognitive impairment and functional impairment you get from the amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles that might be present in someone's brain. Uh, and so, you know, especially as they're trying to create more uh, therapies for Alzheimer's as a disease, uh, I think that this is just an important thing that most of researchers should be aware of, uh, that the most re the proposal statement came out in 2019, uh, but I think they're working on it still this year for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. And we do have a comment and question from Audrey. Um, she states, we have an economic system based on women providing care without compensation or little compensation. The system needs to be overhauled. Caring professions need to be well compensated to reduce the burden on caregivers, especially women of color. And she asks, how can this research be used to advocate for caring professions, compensation and value? Good question. Yeah, it, it's a great question. Um, and, um, you know, I think there are, I can't claim to be a caregiving um, researcher. It was one outcome that I looked at. It is a very important outcome, but I know others have done much richer and more in-depth work um, on this topic, um, which as you say, um, Audrey, is incredibly important. Um, I mean, I think my work just highlights that there's a lot of caregiving going on <laughs> um, and the vast majority of it is unpaid. Um, and, you know, we also have the, the unique benefit in HRS of also looking at the out-of-pocket costs associated with some of that caregiving. I think sometimes that piece of the conversation is missed that people not only donate a lot of their time, um, but they also donate a lot of their money. Um, and that can have, you know, implications for, for years and years to come on them and their family. Um, so yeah, I don't know what the, the solution is societally. I, I'd like to think that our, our research adds, you know, one more drop in the bucket to say like, Hey, look, this is important. People are doing more than, um, maybe we should ask them to do. Um, um. yeah, I don't know if you have anything clean. Well, you had a freeze, Steph, but I think right before it cut off, she was pitching it to you, Adeline, uh, to ask if you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't. I yeah, didn't no, worries. no worries. Uh, I think yes, I agree with Audrey that there should be a lot more compensation. I mean, in my case, I was very lucky that my compensation came in terms of free time that my job allowed me 
to be home uh, when I needed to be with my mother, when I needed to leave early or take a half a day to take her to the doctor's appointment. But there was also a lot of things that, you know, that, for example, if I needed to go on vacation or I needed some time off just to breathe, I have to find ways, you know, I couldn't find someone to take care of her. If I asked the aide to stay, oh, can you come in and stay overnight? I had to pay her out of pocket. Medicaid would not, you know, Medicare would not cover that. So that cost, that's that's a cost that the family had to share. So, or we have to go and find a place. Of, oh, your sound. Back, cut out. So. One moment. Excuse me? Oh, your sound cut out just briefly, but it can't. Oh, God. Everybody's internet is unstable. Yeah. So, yes. So, I do agree with Audrey. There should definitely be some compensation uh, that should be taken into account for the caregivers because it's a lot. And so, very... yeah. Yeah. And I think you raise up a, a really good point, uh, Audrey, because in some ways, if you think about it, um, if you neglect someone and they show up at an emergency room, like you didn't spend time caring for them. It's a bad outcome for the older person, but now the person who bears the cost of that is healthcare insurers. Uh, whereas if you provide excellent care, uh, you're very attentive, you take your time off work, the insurers pay nothing and they don't have to pay out for the hospitalization potentially, but that the where, the, where these costs shift uh, it, it, it's all over the place. And I, I think you, you raise a good point, and I do think that that is one of the questions, but a very hard one to answer in research, but how, to what extent are these costs being shifted uh, onto other people? That is, uh, you know, very active area of research uh, with a lot of nuance to it. Like, I will also add that when you look at caregiving hours, uh, the accounting of it can get kind of nuanced, because if you account for meals that you might cook for one another, uh, it, it you know, you might have a husband who cooks for his wife or a wife who cooks for his husband or partners cooking for each other, partners doing laundry for one another, that all gets counted as caregiving hours. And so then, you know, when you're looking under the weed, into the weeds, is that truly what you're trying to capture if there's a exchange versus if someone's always doing all the tasks, that's a little bit different and maybe that should be counted. So I, there's actually a lot of nuance and you can imagine that uh, trying to adjudicate what's fair in this area is still uh, up in the air. In some of my research I've found, uh, uh, I found that uh, the average caregiving hours that even just like a 65 year old gets is about seven hours a week. Uh, and I think it just reflects that interdependence uh, that, that as a baseline is actually kind of baked into the way we live. Uh, though I don't know if they are being exchanged or whether or not it's unilateral, it, it, it gets very messy. So yeah, uh, Steph, uh, yeah, I think we're, we're about, at about time. Uh, hit it, Steph. <laughs> Go ahead and, and give a big thing Um, just and thank you all for attending today's webinar. Um, a recording will be posted soon on the Aging Initiatives website. Um, and as you sign off, uh, we're, you'll be prompted to complete a very brief survey. We ask you to take just one or two minutes to give us your thoughts and opinions about uh, today's webinar. Uh, big thanks to everyone and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you and sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, you. Thank you.